Hello, listeners. Today is August 30th, 2021. My name is Jay Vall. I'm an interventional spine physiatrist at The Ohio State University and a member of the North American Spine Society. Welcome to our next installment of the podcast series highlighting articles from the Spineline Journal. Today, we have Drs. McNeil, a PGY3 resident of orthopedic surgery, and Dr. Janisa, the chair of orthopedic spine surgery at Loma Linda University. They recently wrote an article titled Hip Spine Syndrome, Avoiding the Pitfalls. Thank you for both uh, taking the time to join us today and chat. You know, personally, I found this article to be very relevant to my practice, uh, as we certainly see our fair share of these types of patients at our spine center at Ohio State. You know, but for some of our listeners who have not had a chance to read your work, uh, can you tell us why hip spine syndrome is important for clinicians to identify and understand? Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, hip spine syndrome. Um, Obviously, first described by Ophiski and McNabb uh, quite a while back, uh, just described this overlap of symptoms that we see in patients that have both degenerative uh, pathologies in the hip and the spine. And this overlap can be uh, pretty challenging uh, for clinicians, regardless of how experienced we are. Uh, it can be really easy, especially in today's world where everyone's very subspecialized to get your blinders on and to get focused in on on what you're there to do, whether it's spine or hip or, or whatever your subspecialty is, and um, you're moving quickly throughout your day, uh, it's really easy to just kind of not think uh, broadly and keep that broad differential. And so uh, just kind of a reminder, I think this is an important topic to just kind of remind ourselves that there is a pretty significant overlap. This is something we're going to see regularly in our practices and something to be aware of because it can, you know, cause dramatic consequences as far as uh, what we're doing for patients, patient care, um, costs uh, of patient care. and So, yeah, I agree uh, with uh, Dr. McNeil. Uh, I think a lot of people who talk about hip spine syndrome is because, especially our demographic, the demographic of the people who have both hip and spine uh, issues are people over 55. And you know, in a and I'm a spine surgeon, and I sometimes get a little too focused a little bit on the spine as being the pain generator. The thing is, I have even I have to be very focused and or at least be cognizant that it may not just be the spine as the pain generator. So once we follow that rabbit hole, which can be a rabbit hole for a specialist or sub super specialist, then we have to ask ourselves: Are we doing right by the patient? Are we doing the right thing? Are we uh, because if it's only spine centered, what if it's a hip problem? What if it's an SI joint problem? So it's not just for spine surgeons. It's not, it's not even just for hip surgeons. It can be for regular orthopedic surgeons. It can be for neurosurgeons, physiatrists, chiropractors, uh, even physical therapists, or even uh, primary physicians. So we have to have a broad uh, uh, knowledge of this uh, phenomenon, knowing that there can be concomitant issues with both the hip, the spine, or the pelvis, because they're actually very related, and making sure we can either use them by either whatever f forms, you know, physical exam, history, to give us an, uh, at least a starting point and go the, down the right path and go through the right algorithms and treatment for these patients. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I work predominantly with spine patients, and we are kind of siloed in our spine center. People send us mainly issues with like back pain, et cetera, but there is a ton of overlap and it's really easy to brush these folks with the same kind of spine first mentality. Um, but then we do run into issues where, you know, the, the spine injections that we're doing or the SI joint that we're doing is not uh, helping and it turns out to be a hip issue and vice versa. We see that sometimes from our sports medicine colleagues where they might be treating a hip for a while and then we realize it's spine and absolutely can be challenging. Is there like one or two things that you think clinicians can do, things they should look for specifically to help them choose the correct management path? Uh, the first time, I know your article talked a lot about the evidence of, you know, what's the sensitivity of, you know, certain pain uh, patterns, and et cetera. What, what are things that clinicians can key in on to help them get on the right path? Yeah, and I think the, I mean, staying along the lines of keeping that broad differential, um, it's something it's easy to forget, but very simple to do when you're seeing a patient, um, whether I'm in a hip clinic or a spine clinic, but if I'm seeing a spine patient, 
quickly asking about the hip. It takes a couple of seconds. You know, how does, do you have groin pain? Um, when you're doing your motor exam um, on your, you know, your neuro exam for a spine patient, uh, it's not, doesn't take much additional effort to just quickly look at their hip motion or, uh, you know, fader, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Are there, are there, are we able to elicit hip pain uh, or reproduce their pain with uh, these prov prov provocative maneuvers of the hip and vice versa. If I'm in a hip clinic, you know, quickly asking about, about, the, about the back. It doesn't take a lot of extra time, uh, but it's something that kind of keep, keeps our minds broad and keeps that open, um, uh, keeps that on our radar. Additionally, the imaging, uh, sometimes our lumbar spine x-rays will catch a little bit of the hip. Sometimes hip x-rays will catch a little bit of the spine. And if you're not too focused in, just take a quick peek at what else, what else is going on. Do they have um, lumbar spine degenerative changes or hip degenerative changes? If we're already seeing that on the imaging, it kind of uh, raises our suspicion for, for needing to ask some of those questions. Cool. And, you know, you know while I kind of have you guys, you know, one thing that I see a lot, and this is kind of like a, me getting to ask the expert here, so I'll kind of take my shot here. But, you know, a lot of times, specifically, we've talked about SI joint pain and, and the provocative maneuvers with SI joint pain, the physical exam maneuvers, your Patrick's test or your Faber's or your sacral thrust. Uh, not always the most reliable thing. One thing in your article you had pointed to that I keyed in on was the sensitivity of pain with internal rotation, like you mentioned, the failure. So, you know, if I have someone who has both SI provocation and failure po that's positive, like pain with internal rotation, and they're having some groin pain, some back pain, uh, you know, which kind of would you choose? There's, I feel like there's so many people after I read your article now, just seeing more and more in clinic that there's people in between here. How do you decide to be on one side of that line uh, or the other the first time? For me, I'll even take it back a little bit to what uh, Dr. McNeil had said, even take it a step back because really what, what drives us into what our thinking is, a couple things, just like the stuff we learned from medical school, Get a good history. A good history really can help you do a lot because, you know, are you having this pain while you're in bed? Are you having the pain with movement? Are you having the pain at the beginning of the day? Are you having the pain in certain motions? They'll, these patients will tell you, you know, I have pain when I'm getting up from a seated position. I have pain when I'm walking. So, I mean, in a way, you can also, they can tell you, and they're not going to say, hey, I have neurogenic claudication. They're not going to say, hey, I have a Patrick's test. But if you listen to them and then the other thing is this. So, you know, just like all the stuff we learn in physical diagnosis and um, uh, early on in medical school, we, we get a good history. We listen, obviously, and then you look at them. And so when you examine them, I mean, not you watch them, how they walk, what kind of length they have. Do they have a, things like you see if they have abductor weakness? Do they have a Trendelenburg lurch? Do they have, you know, a, what kind of, you know, what kind of limp they have? Do they have a leg length discrepancy? So it, you can see it by looking at the patient and then examining. Once you get you do that, then you can go through your list or litany of or focus in on uh, provocative testing, like straight leg raise, like you said about if you're going to say so. The fader, F, you know, F A D I R is a test to see if someone has anterior posterior impingement. So you can do the flexion, A deduction, internal rotation. The problem is internal rotation of the hip can be manifest or can be seen in many different things, right? So it can be the hip. It could be even with someone who has trochanteric problems or piriformis type syndrome. So you, this, the tests are one thing or the provocative test, the exam is another. Once you have the history, the exam, the test, then you can start saying, okay, what is my differential? What are the things that I think they could likely be? And then we ask people, like you, who are in, uh, some uh, intervention, and perhaps you may have to say, hey, this person may need, you know, uh, either a, a CT guide, a floral guided, or ultrasound guided hip injection. And it may, that may uh, rule out some things if it's in the hip. You may, they may need a hip arthrogram. They may need an uh, SI joint injection. Now, an SI joint injection, as I'm sure you can tell us, is very difficult. It's not that it's not a simple, it's not like getting into the hip joint, which is a lot easier or the knee. So yeah, they, certainly. And then that that so hopefully 
when you're when you're seeing patients like that, we have a spine center, and then you have this collaborative thing where you actually can talk to your interventionalist and also help you. You can come up on this diagnosis. So one of the things is don't think it's always on you to figure out everything. It's okay to ask for help. I mean, obviously you don't want to just sit there and just ex expose the patient to so many uh, unnecessary tests. But if it's focused, once you've already done the grunt work of the exam, the history, the provocative testing, then you can start a more focused attempt and trying to elucidate what the primary pain generator is. Yeah, I, do, I certainly think that just with the rush of clinic, uh, some doctors probably forget to listen to their patients as well uh, as they should, or uh, watch their patients walk. I think that's something we always are emphasizing to our residents, to our fellows. Take the time to listen. Take the time to you know watch your patient walk. You'd be surprised how much you'll learn um, just walking 10 or 15 feet down the hallway. Um, yeah, so just very well taken points there. Uh, you know, another thing that your article pointed out, you know, as a non-surgical provider, as, you know, clinician as myself, you know, we're not always looking at the same things as our surgical colleagues, but I like to think, at least in our system, that we work very closely with our surgeons. And so one thing I thought was very interesting was um, your emphasis on the importance of sagittal alignment. And I've understood that in spine, but I don't think I really appreciated how much the hip and spine interact with sagittal alignment um, until you guys had kind of really laid that out. Um, I actually think it's something that a lot of non-operative providers may overlook. I obviously don't want to speak for everybody, but um, it's certainly something that, you know, when we're talking to our residents, when we're talking to our fellows, um, it's not something that for, the, for most of them has ever been brought up. Uh, do you think it's important for non-surgical providers to be able to identify that type of malalignment um, early uh, before the surgical consultation? And what do you think non-operative providers can do to, to help with preoperative management or to help when you see them have better management on your side as well? Well, that's a very difficult question, and it's, uh, it's it's a little complex because a lot of times when we look at the as you were talking about spinal pelvic balance, uh, global uh, global uh, spinal balance in spine surgery, that is the hot topic. For the past, I think ten, at least the past ten years, we have been talking really about not only the spine uh, the balance, but actually that can portend how good a surgery we do. In the past. You know, I've been practicing for 23 years. We didn't even think that much about it. We'd sit there, fuse people. We'd fuse people with flat back, and they'd come back. And you'd wonder, why are they failing? Now we're starting to think, oh, well, geez, we use these terms such as, like, you know, pelvic incidence, uh, pelvic tilt, sacral slope, lumbar lordosis. Now we're even, you know, we go up all to, to the sagittal vertical axis, things like that. Those are all things that, for us as specialists, like especially surgeons that's a big deal for in the hip over the past five to seven years that's been a bigger deal now for a non-operative uh, clinician i don't think it's as as important uh it's actually because those those values that we look at are actually pre-surgical uh parameters that we look for to see What's the successor rate of my surgery? What do I have to do to improve uh, the outcomes of my surgery? We already know that when it's, it's, the literature is very full, especially of people who've had, and we know right now, people who've had like uh, both hip spine syndrome, they have, for example, you think about doing like a fusion on them. We know for primary hips, if you do a primary hip on someone who's got a skewed spine, that increases, and the literature is, is very clear, increases their dislocation or revision rate. And that is also translates to people who are ready for having a revision joint in the, in, the, in the hip, where if they have a fused spine, if you have a fused spine before it, they have a much higher dislocation rate. Uh, and also, more importantly, not just dislocation, their clinical outcomes are, are worse, such as uh, pain scales, and just even clinical criteria like oswestry. Uh, and remember, a hip replacement, for example, is one of the one of the few operations that people really do well with. So how can we mess it up? Well, we can fuse the spine and do it and, and ruin a good operation. 
Wow. You know, uh, guys, I, I found your article very uh, educational. It was really great getting to chat with you guys. And thanks for taking the time to talk to us and take the time to write about hip pine spine syndrome and educate the rest of us here. Anything else you'd like to add um, at this time? I was just thinking in terms of going back to um, the third question you asked about how do you choose mm -hmm. um, you know, SI injection, hip injection, how do we narrow it down? I think in uh, my experience, um, it's very rare that I can't tilt myself one way or the other. Very rarely am I truly 50-50. After I do a good history and a good exam, I can usually convince myself that it's more likely coming from the SI joint or more likely coming from the hip joint. And that's usually what's going to push me towards one or the other. I think both can be very reliable in terms of giving you a good diagnostic idea of what's going on, and hopefully therapeutic treatment for the patient with pain. Um, if it's truly 50-50, I'd probably lean towards doing the hip injection. Like Dr. Denisa said, it's just a lot easier to get in there. We know, we know hip injections easier. have great, sensitivity, <laughs> great specificity. Um, uh, but in general, um, I think I can always get myself one way or the other if I really take the time to do the history and exam. Uh, the two most important questions I think during my exam that I ask, um, you know, where does this hurt when I do this provocative, provocative maneuver? Because you can often make people hurt, but is it where you think it sh they're having pain? And is this the same pain that you're having day to day that bothers you? Because sometimes you, you're you causing them pain, but it's not it's not what bothers them day to day. And that's another way you can really narrow down, like, is this really the hip? Is this the spine? What is it that's bothering them on a day-to-day -day basis? So Yeah, I think when you're doing your physical exam, is this the same pain that bothers you? Is such a, like, a simple, powerful thing while you're doing it. Because, yeah, we can certainly uh, make tight hips hurt and tight hamstrings uh, cause leg pain when you're straight leg, straight leg, straight leg raising folks. And uh, we just, yeah is this the same pain? That's, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, anyways, guys, thank you again, Dr. McNeil, Dr. Denisa from Loma Linda University. Thanks for taking time to sit with us on the NAS podcast. And, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in and good night. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you very much.